Nighttime has long served as a unique access point to the Christian life. For ages, it constituted an important theme in Catholic spiritual and mystical writing, chiseled in the Catholic imagination like letters in black stone. It was at nightfall that Israel won its liberation and came to know the enduring love that God had for his chosen people. So too, it was during the night that God entered the world and came to dwell among us in the flesh. And it was in the darkness of night that Christ chose to institute the light of life, which is the Eucharist, the great memorial of his love and the future pledge of his presence among men. Through the centuries following the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ, Catholics have continued to reflect on the spiritual significance of the night. As a young priest, John Paul II pursued a doctorate in spiritual theology at the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas. There, he would study in depth the mystical writings of the great Carmelite reformer, St. John of the Cross. In that great doctor of the church, the young Wojtyla encountered profound meditations on the dark night of the soul and its progress from the night of death to the bright morning of the resurrection and unending life. The Carmelite saint understood the night, to be sure, as an expressive moment of the total unification of the soul with God, for which each human heart ultimately longs. John Paul II would live his own dark night of the soul under Nazi and Soviet occupation, but he never permitted those oppressive totalitarian regimes to extinguish the flame of love for God in his heart and the spiritual moral heritage of his Christian faith. As a young man in Nazi-occupied Poland, Karol Wojtyla used to join his friends in Krakow's Zebniki district for acts of clandestine cultural resistance. If their secret theater had been found out, Wojtyla could have been deported to a concentration camp to meet with a hideous death. One night in the 1940s in an apartment overlooking the Vistula, he gathered with his friends in a candlelit room to begin a dramatic recitation of Adam Mickiewicz's Polish national classic Pan Tadeusz. At one point in the evening, the Nazi megaphones posted outside began to blare in the streets below, broadcasting another message about a world without God, a message as cold as the frozen waters of the Vistula that night. Yet the college age Wojtyla continued his reading through the night, unfazed. Years later, as the first Polish Pope, he would have occasion to address a much larger crowd in the open air of Warsaw's great victory square. Again he would be interrupted, but this time it would be by the cries of his Polish brothers and sisters shouting with one voice, We want God. We want God. That moment would confirm the Pope in his belief that the cries that emerge from the night are without variance filled with the cheerful expectation of the rising sun. That realization helps to give meaning to the Church's anticipation on the night of Easter, of the night that will be as clear as day, the night that will become our light, our joy. Perhaps it was the deep spiritual significance of the night and its profound relationship to the light of Christ, the light of the world, that prompted Pope John Paul II to gather more than one million young people on the shores of Lake Ontario on a late summer's night in the early 2000s in order to pose to them his timeless but nonetheless urgent question about the strength of our convictions and the foundations of our lives in communion. John Paul was a man of great drama, and so it was fitting that he should have chosen the theater of night and light in order to invite the young people to come inside the church to examine the convictions of Catholics from within the context of faith. For in so doing, the Pope was able to make a compelling appeal from within the world's doubts and confusions, its own night of unbelief, in order to beckon it toward the light of a new evangelization. In this, the Pope was drawing upon another truth precious to Catholics. In order to understand the truth, we must first believe. That is, in order to walk into the brightness of revealed truth, we must first wrestle with the dimness of trusting faith. He understood well our doubts and concerns, aspirations and hopes, fears and anxieties that are inherent in not separate from the life of faith. As the fathers of the Second Vatican Council taught in the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, entitled in Latin Gaudium et Spes, the joys and the hopes 
the griefs and the anxieties of the men of this age, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted, these are the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. Indeed, nothing genuinely human fails to raise an echo in their hearts, for theirs is a community composed of men. United in Christ, they are led by the Holy Spirit in their journey to the kingdom of their Father, and they have welcomed the news of salvation, which is meant for every man. That is why this community realizes that it is truly linked with mankind and its history by the deepest of bonds. We are called to be the light of the world, shining in the dark places of human life. As St. Matthew tells us in his Gospel, we are the light of the world and the salt of the earth.